On Tech News Today, a startup called OnePlus launches a low-cost phone called the OnePlus One. Dish starts streaming TV to phones and tablets starting this summer. HBO comes to Amazon Prime and Google Street View gets a time machine. All that and more come out next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, April 23rd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin, and Jason Howell has the day off. Tech News Today explores the big stories of the day with some of the world's best journalists. Our guest co-anchor today is Renee Ritchie. Renee is editor-in-chief of iMore.com and host of Mac Break Weekly. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you on. We've got some Apple earnings reports, and we're going to talk about that later in the show. But for now, let's get right into the news. A startup called OnePlus launched a low-cost phone today called the OnePlus One. Why don't they just do the math, call it the Two. The smart phone has some high-end specs, but starts at only $299 unlocked. There's a catch. You can buy the phone only by invitation. Sasha Segan is lead mobile analyst at PCMag.com, and he joins us to show us and tell us about this phone. Welcome, Sasha. Hi, thanks for having me on. And there it is in all its glory. Yep, the OnePlus One is a uh, really handsome-looking Android-powered smartphone, as you see here. We have a 5.5-inch 1080p LCD screen, uh, the same Snapdragon 801 processor that's in the Samsung Galaxy S5, and uh, it runs, you'll see this logo on the back here, Cyanogen, which is yeah. a, a popular third-party mod of Android 4.4.2. Um, for $299, I mean, you've also got a 13-megapixel uh, camera on the back, 5-megapixel camera on the front, comes with either uh, 16 or 64 gigs of storage. So you have these Galaxy S5-like specs or these HTC One-like specs at half the price. And if OnePlus can actually deliver enough units and quality units and debugged and QA'd units, uh, this could be a really big deal. So I have so many questions about this. First of all, why is it invitation only? Well, OnePlus is a very small startup. Uh, they're coming out of a company called Oppo, which is a uh, Chinese electronics manufacturer known for high-end home electronics and a couple of smartphones. And they're clearly slowly ramping up production. So they want to keep desire at a fever pitch. That's why they've been leaking information uh, slowly about this phone. But they also want to make sure that they only get as many orders as they can handle. So this by invitation thing is like a controlled base. Data. As they start building these OnePlus One phones, I guess they want to make sure that they all work uh, before they go out to the consumers. Now, one of the uh, goofy uh, uh, facts about this phone is it has some unusual uh, backs that you can get. For example, you can get one with a bamboo back, uh, a different type of wood. They have Kevlar denim. And there's even the white one, uh, uh, we're told, is made out of cashew nuts that have been somehow ground up and turned into a kind of plastic of some kind. Uh, now, how does um, Cyanogen, uh, you know, first of all, are there any Cyanogen mod um, phones out there? And secondly, how does this affect uh, app compatibility? I mean, fortunately, it doesn't appear to affect app compatibility. Uh, this phone, as you can see, it has the full Google suite of apps. It has the Play Store. Um, Cyanogen has been very good at uh, doing upgrades as Google does upgrades. It'll probably get upgrades faster than a lot of other uh, standard manufacturer phones get them. Um, but, uh, in terms of, in terms of those backs and, you know, the cashews and all of that, you know what? I have the white back. It just feels like matte plastic. OnePlus has done an incredibly good job of PR here and of getting, getting buzz going. Um, and a lot of that buzz just seems to me like, like excitement and buzz rather than, uh, rather than stuff that's actually material. Oh, yeah, other Cyanogen phones, uh, 
the only other one I can think of was actually OnePlus's old parent company, Oppo, uh, the Oppo Find 7. So this would be the second Cyanogen phone, as far as I know. Now, the uh, the mid-May launch, it's supposed to launch in mid-May, the actual phone, uh, is going to take place in Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Ty Taiwan, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Gosh, I don't see Canada in there. Sorry, Canada. I think it's in there. No, I think oh, it's in it? there. Okay, good. Uh, and um, and so, you know, th this is a, a, a counterintuitive set of facts. Like, uh, on the one hand, the invitation-only rollout indicates small numbers, and the price indicates massive, uh, you know, economies of scale. So it's curious how they're going to do this. Now, Rene Ritchie, this is really the kind of thing that Apple is increasingly up against with the iPhone. Here's a pretty slick phone that's incredibly cheap. I mean, this is a less than half the price of your average iPhone. Um, how, does this, uh, how does this kind of thing, do you think, affect uh, iPhone sales going forward? I think it's, it's, it's interesting because it affects it not at all in terms of the subsidized market where people only see 99, 199, 299 price tags up front. In markets that aren't subsidized, it'll, it will appeal to people who are or for whom price is the most important feature. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to me, though, is how they're making this price point. We've seen this before in the PC industry where netbook makers would get very low prices, but they did it essentially by destroying their own margins, and that wasn't a way to grow healthy companies. So I think we're going to see this race to the bottom in phones the way we saw it in other technology. But I want to see how sustainable it is. And Apple previously has had a lot of luck just totally ignoring that market and sticking to premium uh, and whether that strategy is what they do for phones as well. Now, Sasha Segan, you've been uh, reviewing and, and trying this phone. Uh, some of the features aren't functional yet, um, but among the features that are functional, uh, what is your analysis? For example, what's the quality of, of the photographs? It has a 13 megapixel camera uh, on the back and a 5 me megapixel camera uh, front facing. What's, your, what's yeah. your evaluation of that and other features? Well, OnePlus, OnePlus made it very, very clear this is not a review unit. This is an early prototype. And every time I emailed them about something that was going wrong, they emailed back saying, not a review unit, early prototype. That said... How very convenient. Yeah. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of little things here about are they going to be able to make enough of them? Are they going to be consistent quality, et cetera, et cetera? That said, uh, the Sony camera on the back seems very nice, could use some software tuning. Uh, the hardware looks very good. Five megapixel camera on the front. Uh, it's unusual to see a five megapixel front camera nowadays. We're just starting to see them. Also seems very good. Uh, app performance with that Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 seems excellent. Uh, some big question marks I have out there. Uh, one of the biggest question marks I have is about call quality, which is still seriously being tuned. I really can't draw any conclusions there. And, of course, for a lot of people, that matters a lot. Absolutely. As you said, the, the company that, uh, that this came from, which is Oppo, uh, that was uh, run by Pete, Pete Lau. Is that correct? Um, I, 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 I'm not very good at memorizing CEO names, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> it's not, not that I important so. for buyers anyway. Um, so, so this has, uh, of course, a custom UI on CyanogenMod and, um, yeah, this, it's a fascinating, uh, phone and I think, um, we'll be looking to see if they can really pull it off. It seems unlikely based on what we know about other things. A lot of people are saying that this is a, uh, Google Nexus killer because of its, low cost and it kind of is, has the similar sort of feel and shape to it as far as I can see from what you're what you're holding in your hand. Well, and it appeals to the same Android geek crowd. I mean, the appeal of Cyanogen is really tapping into these geeks who have been loading Cyanogen onto their phones by themselves for years. And that's the same uh, buying group as would buy a Nexus. But once again, Google does tend to contract with these well-known manufacturers who can create, who can build large quantities of phones at affordable prices with reliable quality. The Nexus 5 by LG has been of excellent quality all around. And uh, I feel like this is the fifth or sixth time I've said it, but the thing that OnePlus hasn't been able to prove just because they're a startup is if they make 50,000 of these, can they make 50,000 and will all 50,000 work properly? Well, that's a good point. Well, Sasha Segan, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today and telling us about this phone and also showing it to us. Thanks for having me on. All right. Sasha Segan uh, can be found at PCMag.com and also on Twitter at Sasha Segan. Let me spell that for you. S-A-S-C-H-A-S-E-G-A-N. Well, in a sec, we're going to tell you what's happening with 
bunch of TV news, but first I want to tell you about ShareFile. If you're sending files around and you know you are, the worst thing you can do is just attach it to email and send it off into the open, open internet. There are a few basic things that every user, user should do to protect their own security, uh, simple common sense things, and one of them is to use ShareFile because with ShareFile, you don't actually send the file as an attachment. You send a link, a secure link, to, to a location where they can download it from the cloud. But there are all kinds of additional benefits as well. For example, you can send it and have it be downloaded only once or three times or as many times as you like. You can specify exactly who is allowed to download it and who isn't. And you can be notified when it's been downloaded. So people see ShareFile as the most secure way to send files around. Of course, that's true. Others see this as a way to send enormous files. You can send files of a gigabyte or two gigabytes or five gigabytes, enormous files that would often be blocked with a lot of uh, corporate uh, firewalls that are simply blocking file sizes of a certain uh, size. And this gets right past that because, again, there is no attachment. It's simply a secure link. But I like to use it for everything, any kind of attachment, whether it's a security issue or whether it's a size issue or whether it's none of the above. I, it's so convenient and easy to use and so pleasant to use because it gives you and keeps you informed about what's happening with the file you sent. I really like it. So sign up today for our 30-day free trial. No obligation at all. Just go to sharefile.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter TNT. And remember, visit sharefile.com, and don't forget to type in TNT. Well, DISH is planning to roll out its internet streaming TV service this summer, according to an exclusive on Bloomberg News by Alex Sherman and Edmund Lee. Alex Sherman, who is a reporter for Bloomberg, is with us to explain this. Welcome, Alex. Hey, thank you. Now, you wrote that this service will be the first of its kind. What's unique about this offering exactly? To this day, there have been several entrants who have tried to attempt to be what's known in the business as a virtual MVPD, and that's simply jargon for a provider of live television uh, that's over the Internet that you can pay for that's separate from your cable bill or your pay TV bill. So that's what DISH is trying to do here. DISH spends a lot of money installing a satellite dish on people's homes. The, the subscriber acquisition cost for DISH Network is about $800. That's a lot of money to send someone to someone's house, install it. Maybe they have to come again. There's obviously the price of the satellite itself. So DISH can get away from all of that uh, potentially if they're able to sell an over-the-internet bundle of channels. And the problem hasn't been that DISH uh, has wanted to do this. DISH has wanted to do it for a long time, years. The problem has been the programmers have been very hesitant to do this because the programmers get a lot of money for DISH, like ESPN, uh, or other sports networks and popular cable channels. So finally, Dish has convinced at least Disney, which owns ESPN, to say yes to this, and now Dish is trying to get other programmers to come on board. Now, you had some exclusive information about who some of those other programmers might be. Can you uh, tell us about uh, who's talking? Dish is talking to a lot of programmers at this point. NBC is a big one because NBC Universal owns uh, about 10 major popular uh, cable networks out there in addition to the NBC broadcast station. Um, you know, I'm thinking about MSNBC, CNBC, Bravo, E. They're all owned now by, by Comcast, which owns NBC Universal. Uh, so if, if Dish can strike a deal with NBC Universal to get a bunch of these uh, cable stations to get NBC Network, they already have a deal with Disney to get ABC, ESPN, the Disney Channel. That's a large chunk of programming there where they can now have a viable product that someone may want to buy for, say, $30 a month. The question will be, how many of those networks will NBC have to give to them? Uh, NBC is sort of locked into doing a deal with Dish, potentially, because of uh, a, an agreement that Comcast made when they bought NBC a couple years ago, which basically said, we have to match equivalent deals from programmers out there. Uh, now, at the time, that was only for generic traditional pay TV. The technology has advanced, so this this first-of-its-kind service may or may not apply to that so-called consent decree, but that's what's being talked about right now, and that's why DISH is going to NBC first to try to get as much programming from them as possible. Hmm. Now, it seems to me that DISH customers are a certain type of person. They're probably a little older, a little richer, uh, and this uh, play by DISH seems to be aimed at targeting younger people uh, who are probably going to watch on their phones or on tablets. Is that your reading as well? 
Absolutely. Dish doesn't want to cannibalize its current business. So the current Dish customer probably pays 70 or $80 a month for pay TV. And, of course, Dish doesn't really have a substantial broadband service. They do offer satellite broadband, but they don't have that many customers. Dish has about 14 million pay TV customers, only about 450,000 broadband customers at this point. So Dish is very cognizant. They don't want to cut into all of those millions of people that are paying them 70 or $80 a month for pay TV with a product that they're only going to get 20 or $30 a month. So it's going to be specifically targeted to younger people who watch on their phones and on their tablets. Uh, and I think Dish is going to be very aware to make sure that their traditional pay TV bundle still offers a lot more than this online package. Now, uh, what's the competitive landscape for them going to look like a year from now? I mean, we, you already pointed out that this is a unique offering, but that's not going to last. Uh, Intel failed to uh, bring out a service like this. They sold everything to Verizon. Sony's trying to do something. AT&T just announced yesterday that it's uh, going to introduce an online TV service by the, the end of this year. What's this going to look like uh, by, by next April? The potential of this being a real game changer is out there. If this product is uh, strong enough so that it gets a lot of people to sign up, the whole world of pay TV theoretically could be changed because we could see companies like Comcast, a regional cable player, a company that has traditionally only sold in its particular footprint, offer up a product where now anyone could be a Comcast subscriber if they simply follow the DISH method where they offer an internet TV package. So I could live in New York City, for, for instance, where I can't get Comcast, and I could theoretically buy a Comcast product if they follow DISH's lead. So definitely all eyes on DISH and on this particular service. Uh, and if it gains popularity, you're right, I would expect to see a lot of these images products out there. Well, thank you, Alex Sherman, for coming on Tech News today and telling us about your exclusive. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. All right. You can find Alex Sherman on Bloomberg.com and on Twitter at Sherman4949. In other streaming TV news, Amazon has made a deal with HBO to provide Amazon Prime Instant Video members with past HBO shows like The Sopranos and The Wire. Amazon just got a whole lot more violent. This is the first time HBO has licensed content to an online-only subscription service. And Renee Ritchie, this is, a, this is really an interesting thing. I mean, here, Amazon, I don't know how Amazon pulls off these deals, but uh, this is an amazing uh, exclusive uh, feature that they've, they've added to their lineup. Oh, it absolutely is. And, you know, HBO lives off its subscriber base and it has a lot of premium customers. And doing this, it's probably a little bit scary to the traditional HBO management because providing streaming, maybe, you know, maybe, Mike, you'll wait three years before you watch uh, the Sopranos or Wired or whatever it is because it's free on streaming. But I think anything they can do now in this competitive landscape where there is Netflix and there are channels, you know, like we just heard that are going to dish uh, makes IPTV and that kind of stuff the future. Yeah, and as you said, you, you mentioned the three-year time period. That's approximately the age when uh, shows become eligible to be moved over there. They're not going to allow you to watch the new shows. You can't watch Game of Thrones, but yeah. you can watch these older shows. And this is seen as a way to sort of introduce HBO programming to a bunch of people without uh, you know, competing against themselves. And, uh, and of course, uh, HBO Go service uh, is going to be available on Amazon Fire TV uh, as well, which which uh, is, you know, a, a, an incredible embrace between HBO and Amazon. Now, um, Amazon, of course, recently raised their prime price from $79 to $99. And, and, and Renee Ritchie, I think this is probably one of the reasons they did it. They're going to be offering a lot more. Well, that's what's happening now is there's only, especially with a company like Amazon, they don't make much money in hardware. They famously don't even sell the Kindle and their devices in markets where they can't sell their content too. And that, that means that the content is what people are going to want. You're going to get an Amazon Kindle Fire because you can get HBO. It's not great for me. It's not great for international people because Amazon has done a lousy job of getting their services beyond the U.S. But for anybody in the U.S., Amazon, I think, is becoming an increasingly attractive service. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in a somewhat related story, AOL has cut a deal with Miramax to offer full-length movies to U.S. users. These movies are watchable on phones, tablets, or PCs. A new movies section will be featured across the AOL on network as part of the agreement. And uh, again, you know, lots more options for wasting your time uh, staring at a screen here, Renee Ritchie. Um, this, this launches April 30th. Uh, and 
how they're going to do this is they're going to have what you know tens of fil films. That I guess that they mean 10, 20, 30 uh, films at a time from the Miramax library rotating on a monthly basis. So the whole catalog won't be available all the time. They're just going to bring things out. And, of course, their 700-plus film library is pretty huge. They have titles like Pulp Fiction, Chicago, Goodwill Hunting, The English Patient, Life is Beautiful. Those count, sound a little dated to me as well, so I don't think they have the newest uh, movies, but this is, um, you know, this is yet another, uh, you know, uh, way that the internet is going to be providing TV and movies. And it's really interesting because you have these companies with back catalogs, you have the companies making new movies, you have the companies with internet pipes, and you have the companies that own studios. And it, it's a bit of a mess right now. It's a bit of a, of a period where we're trying to figure this out. Because right now I have to go to nine or ten different services to find everything that I want. Traditionally, iTunes was nice. You know, and Google Play is nice because there's a lot of stuff you want all in one place. You can just go there, search, and buy it. With the streaming stuff, because there are exclusive deals and because there are so many providers and because so many of the cable companies have their own studios attached to them in one form or another it really is like a bunch of fiefdoms and that's the part i hope shakes out sooner rather than later yeah so do i well most samsung phone owners like their phones but they hate the software samsung pre-installs on them according to new research by strategy analytics samsung galaxy s4 and galaxy s5 users each spent an average of seven minutes on those apps during the month of march seven minutes in a whole month those same users averaged 149 minutes on the same month on just three of Google's apps. This doesn't surprise me at all, Renee Ritchie, that I think people hate crapware of all kinds. And, you know, people just don't like the stuff that uh, mobile phone uh, handset makers bundle. They just, they just don't like it for the most part. It's interesting because Samsung in many ways is a company divided against itself and they're they're probably more reliant on Android than they'd like to be, which is why they're working on Tizen and Tizen phones. But the other, there's two email apps on there. There's this, I don't know if there still is, but there used to be a Samsung browser. There's Samsung Voice. There's Samsung Finder. There's all these apps that duplicate Google features and Google features are the ones people want to use. So it's sort of, it, it's in Samsung's interest to get people to use their stuff. But at the same time, it's not friendly to customers to sort of bifurcate their experience. Yeah, and you mentioned Tizen. Tizen is a mystery to me. I can't figure out what, what Samsung is really up to there. I think some people within Samsung are gung-ho and want to make Tizen the replacement. Uh, for example, a Samsung Media Solutions Center President uh, Hong Wan Pyo yesterday told reporters that uh, Samsung is developing Tizen for a, quote, post-Google era, unquote. And he said Samsung uh, plans to release products that run on Tizen as early as possible and that they're looking for mergers and acquisitions to accelerate the move from Android to Tizen. And of course, the biggest barrier right now, as he admitted, is that there are no apps on Tizen. And so that's a huge problem. But you hear that kind of language from some Samsung executives and others are saying, no, we're committed to Android and so on. And I really don't see how they could possibly uh, make that transition. I mean, it's just it's just a scary transition. All the apps are on iOS and Android, and you know, they I think they would be nuts. And you already see them doing it with their uh, smartwatches, where most of their new smartwatches run Tizen. It just doesn't seem like a good idea. It feels to me sort of like those MacBook Air on arms that are on arm processors that live in Apple's labs. It's a sort of Damocles that you hold over your partner's head and saying, you know, when we're negotiating our next deal, you realize that we're investing heavily in Tizen and we want to make sure that you treat us really well because we have the secondary strategy. But like you said, they would be they're so dependent on the Android ecosystem now that while it's probably what they want in their future, it's probably not a realistic option for the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a new report out of UNESCO says that mobile phones have triggered a reading revolution in seven countries where literacy rates are low. The report looked at the reading habits of 5,000 mobile phone users in Ethiopia, Ghana, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe. And it found that nearly two-thirds enjoy reading more after doing it on their phones, and one-third said they use their phones to read to their children, which, of course, is very important. If you read to children, they're more likely to become literate readers themselves when they grow up. You know, we, we get all kinds of uh, bad news about phones, kids spending too much time, people spending, uh, wasting too much time goofing around with, you know, trivial social networks and uh, games and so on. But here's a case where it's boosting literacy, which is exactly what, uh, what some of these countries need. It's, it's just wonderful to see this kind of news. 
It's fantastic. I think when a new technology comes out, we look at it as a new technology, but when it starts to mature and when it becomes mainstream, then we look at it as a tool and a tool can be used either productively or it can be used, you know, not productively. And we're getting to the stage where people can now just carry hundreds of books with them, especially there, there's thousands of books that are just free that people anywhere can download and read on their phones. My sister and my mother, one of their primary functions with their phones is audio and paper books. They just use them all the time because they always have the device with them and they no longer need to have to actually carry physical books or tapes with them. And I think that is what's making the difference. It's the same thing where countries are going mobile first or they're going broad uh, or they're going um, sorry cellular first. They can bring all these books to their device that they have with them. It just becomes a greater value for that device. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, of course, one of the uh, barriers to all of this is that many of the people in these countries that I mentioned are using feature phones. They're not using smartphones. And so that's a barrier. There's so much content being created for smartphones, but not feature phones. So a San Francisco startup called World Reader is actually, uh, it's a nonprofit organization. You can check it out if you want to get more involved in this, but they're providing uh, reading materials. Uh, so far, they have an app that uh, runs on feature phones uh, that offers 6,000 mostly free eBooks. Another one is Language. Uh, in many of these countries I mentioned, uh, people do speak English, but some of the poorest people don't necessarily speak English. And so that's a challenge. If they if they speak a, a language that's not spoken by a huge number of people, it's very difficult to find book content on it. Uh, and um, But their app has more than 300,000 monthly active users in developing countries. So it sounds like they're doing something right. Yeah, it's the doc democratization of literacy. Yeah, absolutely. That's a wonderful story. Well, Apple reports earnings later today. Analysts are concerned with both iPad and iPhone demand. iPhone sales bring in half the company's revenues. Of course, Renee Ritchie, you're the consummate expert on this topic. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that people are concerned that, uh, you know, analysts are concerned. Uh, analysts are people, too, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that they're facing flat revenues um, and low earnings growth. Um, is, what do you think about this? What do you think is going to happen today? Uh, I think largely uh, when you take the sum total of all the predictions, uh, they're largely right. It's not an explosive quarter for Apple. That's typically the holiday quarter. And in these quarters, Apple does ship less units. Also, the iPhone and the iPad are maturing products. And there will be a physical limit. Apple won't be able to sell 20 billion iPhones. So once, once you realize there's a physical limit for products, it's just what the actual number is. The sales cycle for tablets might be longer than phones. Maybe people don't replace their iPads every two years. When you factor in all these things, when you factor factor in new devices on the low end. For example, some people don't need a full tablet like Apple or Samsung or even Amazon makes. They just want to watch videos. There's a $50 tablet for that. Or they want to just use a feature phone to read their books. You know, and there's a, a free or $50 feature phone. These are all things that are working to cap the total growth of a company like Apple. And unfortunately, the market works on growth, not on profits. Apple is still going to be one of the most profitable companies and, you know, outside of those that have oligopoly control of fossil fuel resources. But Wall Street's going to focus on what can you do for me next? They absolutely will. And it's, I think, the, most, the single most astonishing business fact about Apple is that in this market where there are literally, if you count all the Chinese companies, hundreds of handset makers in the world, and Apple by itself makes, what, upwards of two-thirds of the profits in that industry. That's astonishing. You, I can't think of any other industry where that has been the case ever. Uh, except for in highly monopolized uh, industries. Uh, so that is an astonishing thing. Some of the things that are unknown that uh, we're going to find out during this call are, what is the effect of the Galaxy S5 on iPhone sales? What happened in China since the China Mobile deal? Of course, China Mobile is the world's largest carrier. Personally, I think the China sales are going to be bigger than people think they were. Uh, what is the impact of uh, Apple deciding to sell the iPhone 4 in Brazil, India, Indonesia, and other countries? And uh, But mostly, I think analysts are going to be looking at what are the prospects for Apple's uh, long-term growth, as you as you hinted at, and of course everybody wonders, uh, you know, is Apple going to come out with an iWatch? Will that have that have any significant impact? Is you know because it's not going to be a massively mainstream product like the iPhone. Uh, will Apple compete in the living room? There's so much competition in the living room. Everybody's expecting Apple to come out with a TV or a new box. Uh, or make some huge play and be very successful there. But where is it? And we still haven't heard anything concrete, just a lot of rumors. So it's going to be an inter interesting call uh, uh, today, even though it's not an interesting quarter for Apple. Uh, what's really interesting is Apple's future. Uh, Tim Cook has been promising exciting things for quite a while now. And so I think everybody's ready for some exciting things. Yeah, I think it's exactly what you said. People are going to demand that Apple do the next thing, but the next thing is not clear. Like you said, 
an, an iWatch, even if it's hugely successful, won't make the money of an iPhone. The iPad doesn't make that money. An Apple TV or television or a car or you know a, a flying saucer will not make the amount of money as an iPhone. So Apple isn't living in a world where expectations are completely unaligned with the, the, the short-term future of their company and how they navigate those waters is going to be one of the most interesting things, I think, for us to watch. Yeah, and I think the thing that people don't pay enough attention to from a business perspective, business perspective, is Apple's upside potential in the area of commerce. Using an iPhone uh, to buy things, they have huge advantages there, one of which is iBeacon, which people don't pay enough attention to. iBeacon is a huge, huge, huge product uh, technology, et cetera, that's making enormous strides behind the scenes. You don't really see these beacons around. People aren't really interacting with them that much yet. But the combination of iBeacon and the fact that Apple's got your credit card, you know they do. Apple and Amazon are the two companies, they have everybody's credit card. And so switching over to using them to buy things will be a trivial uh, change. It doesn't require a huge change in behavior. I think at some point very soon, Apple's going to flip a switch and just dominate uh, e you know, commerce and brick and mortar commerce, e-commerce and so on. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, absent that next breakthrough product, it becomes a bunch of little products. And what Apple's been very good at is increasing the value of the iPhone. If they don't want to make a budget phone, they have to make the iPhone more valuable. And things like iBeacon absolutely do that. Things like the Apple TV or iWatch, where owning an iPhone becomes a better experience. Even CarPlay, if your car is better because you own an iPhone, that makes the iPhone and the iPad more valuable. And it helps Apple make those premium dollars and get that profit share of the industry. Absolutely. So we'll all be watching the... Uh the earnings call and make sure you go to imore.com to to get the information about what they announce and what the impact will be. Well, in a sec, we're going to tell you uh, what's new about Facebook's acquisition of Oculus VR. But first, I want to tell you about Squarespace. I found that in the last few years, I care more and more about aesthetics. I, I choose apps sometimes based on whether they're ugly or pretty, whether they're elegant or or clunky. And if you want an elegant website, and you really should. If you have a website and want to build a website, you should build an elegant, beautiful one. The place to do that is on Squarespace. Squarespace is one of our sponsors today, and this is a fantastic site for building a, a website, and I'm going to tell you why. You build a website not from scratch, of course, but starting with templates that have been designed by Squarespace's brilliant designers. They have 25 beautiful templates that you can start with, and then you can go in there and customize your site totally with without any knowledge skill experience or anything it's amazing to be able to do that the power that it gives you to do that if you've got a business you want to sell things all subscription plan levels have e-commerce and you can also use their logo creator tool if you want to ch check out the logo creator tool just go to blog.squarespace.com and there's some videos there that show uh, how that works but it's really an amazing uh, f uh, feature that they offer Squarespace is inexpensive. It starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Uh, they have multiple packages, but again, all of them support e-commerce. And of course, Squarespace is mobile ready. Your website will look fantastic on a mobile device. It'll look fantastic on an enormous big screen device. It doesn't matter because Squarespace recreates the page on the fly for the device, and you don't have to do anything to make that effect happen. It simply happens. And of course, they have amazing mobile tools for you to manage your site on the go. So start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code TNT and that'll get you 10% off the price and also show your support for Tech News Today. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. And remember that a better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Well, the FTC announced today that it has approved Facebook's $2 billion acquisition of virtual reality startup Oculus VR. Uh, in related news yesterday, uh, uh, Facebook said that they are thinking about using Oculus VR to do virtual reality style movies. I'm not sure how that would look, but they said it and they said that was a real possibility. In other news, Google Maps Street View now lets you go back in time. A new feature called Time Machine went live today. It gives you a slider control for Street View images from past years all the way back to 2006. So if a Street View image supports Time Machine, you'll see a clock icon in the lower left corner of the page. It's pretty cool, don't you think, Renee Ritchie? This is a it's kind of nice to go to go to your street and see what it look like, looks like today, what it looked like a couple years ago, all the way back to 2006. Yeah, this is fantastic. This is the kind of stuff that Google does best. They're building the Star Trek machine, and part of that is to you know scrub back in time and see how things were a decade ago. And uh, I just hope they do more of this in more places. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, of course, they're starting in 2006 with this feature, and I have the feeling that 
you know, in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years, it'll still go back to 2006. They'll keep adding newer and newer photos uh, with Street View. And so, you know, this, this actually has a, um, also has a sort of historical value over time. Uh, you can go to places that have been ravaged by natural disasters and so on. You can see, uh, uh, you know, before the disaster, after the disaster and how they've recovered. It's just a great tool for, for people, and they've, they've integrated it very subtly with that little icon. It's not really an in-your-face thing. You kind of have to know about it. But once you do know about it, you can check it out, and it's just a really cool thing. Uh, and I, I love what Google does with Google Maps. It's, it's really a fantastic service. You can show your kids where you, where you grow up. That's right. <laughs> it's always fun. Everybody should go check out their house on Street View. If your house has been street viewed, uh, you know, sometimes it can be surprising, you know, what's happening on the lawn, wh whether your car, whose car is there, whatever. It's, it's kind of a fun thing to do. And, of course, that changes from time to time. Well, Renee Ritchie, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today. It's great to have you on. Oh, thank you for having me anytime. Yeah, I'd love to have you back uh, very soon. Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, your writing, and I, I enjoy your work on MacBreak Weekly. So it's great to have you Likewise, on Tech News absolutely. today. Likewise, absolutely. All right. Well, there are many ways to subscribe to Tech News today, and probably the best one is to go to twit.tv slash TNT. Uh, you can subscribe to the audio version or the video version. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is Tech News Today TV. You can send us an email at TNT at twit.tv or leave us a voicemail by calling 260-TNT-SHOW. Why would you want to do that? Because we want to hear from you and we want to integrate your voice into this show. Also, don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.